while everybody always focuses on money, the most important thing when you ask our fans what they'd want from the players are, is time. How do you give of your time? And the great thing about time is anybody can give time, right? It just requires you to be present, it requires you to be engaged, and it requires you to listen and really kind of look to connect with people. Hi, I'm Rachel Krause. And I'm Carol Stern. And we are here to explore and unpack the essence, architecture, and DNA of purpose across industries, professions, relationships, and even within paradox. So on this podcast, we're going to unlock the stories and the journeys of our guests. We're hoping to unlock pathways to grow, to gain, and to give. And for the next couple of episodes, we're going to be playing on purpose. Exploring the intersection of purpose and sports. Game on. Welcome, Todd Jacobson. Todd is the SVP of Social Responsibility for the NBA, overseeing the NBA, the WNBA, and the NBA Development League social responsibility efforts. You know, Todd, rather than my tell your whole bio, why don't you start by telling us a little bit of how you got where you are? Well, first, I just want to say thank you to you and Rachel for having me uh, today on the podcast. For me, sport has always been uh, such an instrumental part of my life. Um, both my parents are teachers. I grew up in a household where uh, playing sports was encouraged every season. They both are athletic directors as well growing up. So for me, I was raised on the fields, around teams. And so I saw the transformative work sport can do for individuals and for groups. My parents got divorced at a young age, and sport was what kind of kept me on the straight and narrow as I kind of went through a difficult time. And uh, for me, I always knew it was going to be something I wanted to give back uh, the way it had given to me. I think the challenge when I was growing up was, besides for being a teacher or a coach, there wasn't a lot of opportunity in the space. And so when I started pursuing, uh, a lot of people saw a jock trying to do something in sport, but I saw the power of sport and what it can be. I think for me, the most transformative uh, moment for me in my career when I was doing this was in 2003 when I first got the opportunity to go to South Africa and represent the NBA on our first trip back to the continent to do a major program. And we were going to a township, Soweto, the southwestern township, one of the largest townships on the continent, uh, specifically Cliptown. Uh, I know, Carol, you and I have been there together. Cliptown is one of the poorest uh, townships. 80% of the people there don't have running water or electricity. And yet it's only a stone throws away from Nelson Mandela Stadium where the 2010 World Cup was held. They have no census to this day. And when you think about it, just to kind of describe it, if you put together four football fields, you know, where Freedom Square is in the middle of Cliptown, you have about 50,000 people that live there. Uh, again, no running water, electricity for about 80% of it. They actually barter car batteries for electricity so they can cook food and do their homework. They have 48 working taps of water when they're working in the community. So when you go into this community for the first time, you're just immersed in a completely different world. These kind of shanty huts, as far as the eye can see. So imagine a bathroom, you know, made of aluminum with about 10 to 15 people living inside. For me, I was incredibly nervous and excited. It was my first trip, and I pulled into this organization called the Soweto Cliptown Youth Trust. And the drums are going, and the kids are dancing, and I had goosebumps up my arms and on my neck. And I slowly walk over to this group, and the music and the dancing stops. And the kids are just staring at me. And this is the first time I came to understand what I've learned is the universal look of complete confusion and utter disappointment when I'm there to represent the NBA uh, at an event. <laughs> Slowly, the kids are staring at me, and a hand goes up, and I say, yes. And he goes, NBA? I said, yes. And more confusion, and I think I saw some tears. And I didn't know how I was going to recover from this moment. And then another hand went up, and I get the inevitable next question I got as I've traveled in the world. And they say, do you, do you know Michael Jordan? I said, Yes, I do. I've worked with them, and immediately my street credibility goes up. So now this is 2003, but then the most amazing thing happened. You know, hand after hand goes up, and it felt like an NBA press conference. Here I am in this community, no running water electricity, and they're asking me questions about whether Dikembe Mutombo is going to lead the league in blocks and what's the relationship between Kobe and Shaq and all these things. And it was a moment where I saw the transformative power of the NBA and our players to make a huge difference in any community around the world. But the best thing I realized about that story and what really kind of reaffirmed my belief in the power of sport was that you don't have to travel halfway around the world to see that incredible impact. You know, I saw it with our players in small moments, whether it be visiting a Make-A-Wish family or the work that LeBron's doing with the I Promise School, the work that Kevin Love's doing around mental health and meeting with groups and explaining to everybody that's okay to share how you think and feel. These are things that are transformative and they mean everything to someone that needs it the most. And you know, when we're going to talk about MBA Cares in a little bit, this is what MBA Cares 
why it works for us. Our players get it, and they have been leaders in it, and they know it takes an incredible team working together to make that difference. So amazing story. Um, you know, Todd, how, does that, how has that transformed then to what's happened since? You know, MBA Cares has evolved over time, and I think if you look at the purpose space, just for all business, it's evolved over time. I think when we launched MBA Cares back in the early 2000s, so we launched MBA Cares in 2005 as an opportunity to really um, make a difference in a vehicle. For us, it was at a very kind of transitional point in kind of who the MBA was. How people felt about our business and our players was at an all-time low. At that point, we are coming off a really kind of crazy situation in the malice in the palace in terms of the, uh, the the rumble that had taken place after a fight had broken out by Meta World Peace and Ben Wallace and corporate of the fans. And we knew we needed to bring about some significant change. And we kind of attacked it. There wasn't one thing you can do. There was a lot of things you can do. And, you know, when we were looking at different things, the first thing was to rework our mission as an organization, that the social responsibility work has changed over time. But what hasn't had changed over time is it has to be a top-down approach, that unless you really believe in this work and that you're going to really prioritize it with some of your other key objectives in your business, it's not, you're not going to be successful. You know, you have, this has to be authentic. You have to bring humility to the work, but you have to bring consistency and commitment to it as well. And I think for us, reworking our mission bought, brought everybody in the organization as well. But after you rework your mission, you have to think about how you're going to revise your strategy to bring that mission to life. And one of the key moments to that was our MBA CARES program being this vehicle. And when we launched MBA CARES at the time in social responsibility, a lot of organizations did not have their own initiative. Now, you look, a lot of companies have their own initiative. They lead. They lead with their values. They, they, they're doing these things. For us in early 2000s, this wasn't the case, particularly in sport. If you looked at sport at the time, the NFL had a great relationship with the United Way and was doing a lot. Baseball worked a lot with Boys and Girls Club of America, and a lot of leagues were doing fantastic work. And, you know, we decided we we're going to launch our own initiative. This was something new. You know, when we thought about it, we focused on three areas, education, youth and family development, and health and wellness. And the reason we did that is it covers the gamut. It's very broad on purpose because you needed to allow for maximum flexibility as you started doing things globally, that every community and society is different and you want to bring those values. But how you do the work and how you show up has to be a little bit different in order to really drive the impact that you want. But as we were doing this and we laid it out, it was great. But what we realized, which is fascinating, and again, something you see common now but not there, was we really needed to set some key goals of what we were going to do. And at the time, we decided to set three goals, philanthropy, service, and legacy. And, you know, over five years when, when uh, you know, uh, former Commissioner David Stern announced this, he had said, look, we're going to do this. Over five years, we're going to raise and contribute $100 million as an MBA family. We're going to, you know, give of our time and donate a million hours of hands-on service. And we're going to create, at the time, we said 100 places where kids and families can live, learn, or play. Now, when we did this, it was trying to encapsulate and really kind of put some tangible, kind of quantifiable pieces around our work. But what it really did is it galvanized the entire MBA family to see this is something I can get behind. And when you talk about sports, you're talking about a very competitive community. And our teams and our players and our governors and everybody really got behind this. And we saw the power of you know, really setting a goal and seeing what you can achieve. And you know, to give you an idea of how quickly we got to some of these goals, particularly on the legacy piece, we didn't know, you know would we be able to create 100 places you know, whether it be, you know, when I can tell you a little bit about what they are. And we did that in six months. Our teams did that. And, you know, since we're now at over 2,200 uh, places across the world in 40 different countries and territories, everything from, you know, income generation projects we launched in India to new computer centers in the favelas of Brazil to right here in the United States, you know, doing incredible work at boys and girls clubs with new technology, STEM labs, we do uh, spaces for teens. We're doing new basketball courts, obviously, being the NBA, but trying to create safe places where kids can play. And it really took off from there. And it was really inspiring and power, and you seeing everybody together. While everybody always focuses on money, the most important thing when you ask our, our fans what they'd want from the players are, is time. How do you give of your time? And the great thing about time is anybody can give time. Right? It just requires you to be present, it requires you to be engaged, and it requires you to listen and really kind of look to connect with people. And it's an amazing thing when you give of your time and you're present. And one of the things I always tell the players when I'm talking about time is, you know, think about when you were younger and that one person that made a difference. We talk about mentorship and how important mentorship is, and mentorship takes a lot of commitment. But those transformative moments in your life happen at different points. And you never know, and we all have them. For me in sport, I was younger, I was seven years old, and I was in the airport, and I was a tennis player, and I saw Jimmy Connors. 
Now, Jimmy ha has had a reputation sometimes to be a little surly at times. I learned that later on, but to me, he was my hero. And he would, couldn't have been lovelier. I went over, I was, I'm, I'm a lefty, and he, I showed him my stroke, and he said, that's great, let me see your backhand. And um, he signed my fun pad at the time, and I still have that autograph in that moment. And I share that story with the players because I tell them, I'm like, those moments that we talk about, you might forget after you high five that child. You might forget when you leave that conversation. They won't. They'll take that with them as long as they can. And we've seen it. And we saw it, you know, I'll give you, we had a couple players that got drafted this year that were in our junior NBA program. So the longevity and carrying it through that these players really represent and understand that and our players have really taken it upon themselves to make those moments. That time has been really important. So when we launched NBA Cares and did this, those commitments really helped us kind of drive forward in this work. The work has changed, I think, Carol, to your point. It's evolved. You know, we've seen this over time in society and certainly where we are now, much different to where you are. This work now is seen, you know, as a tool for measurement in business. It's seen as an opportunity that business has a, a really key role and responsibility, not just to do things externally, but creating a great culture and work environment for their employees. All of these things, and that just got accelerated during the pandemic. And there's a lot of talk and chatter about that work these days, about the relevance and what it means and how it shows up. But one thing has never changed. Whatever you want to call it, it is a competitive advantage when done right and committed from the top down. And we've seen it, and we've seen it come to life in the NBA, and we've seen what it can do when you're consistent and you have clear values that everybody follows and goes along. You might not all agree on how you're going to get there, but that starting place of being committed to the work and those values is what drives that commitment and purpose. It's interesting because I, you know, having seen it, and, and first of all, when you talked about what that one moment means, I've tried to walk through an airport with Dikembe, you know, and it's like everybody and their brother wants a picture, and he stops and he takes a picture with everybody and their brother. So I also think, you know, uh, David had a vision, and I, you know, and I think he, he spread that vision through the league, and, and Adam has grown that vision, you know, and, and, and added to it his own. In the beginning, it was a cost center. Do you still view it that way? You know, it's, it's interesting. I never did. Um, you know, when I look at these programs, it, it's really kind of, a, to, to your point, Carol, it's really a point of view. Um, and I never look at investment as transactional. You know, you look at spreadsheets and things, and yes, obviously we need to be committed to the quarterly reports and things of that nature. But the sustainability in business and building that foundational work, this work is key. If you're authentic and you're committed and you believe in it, you're going to retain and recruit better talent. People are going to want to be a part of what you're doing. Um, you're going to bring partners along that want to be a part of how you're going about doing that work and bringing about change. And you're going to inspire others. And I've seen that as a competitive advantage, and that drives business opportunity, right? For us at the league, David used to say, it's how people feel about your players. And, you know, you think about it, if, if people love your players and they really think about it in that way, they're going to buy their jerseys, they're going to attend the games, they're going to follow them on social, all those things that you see to really bring them apart but also inspire them in a really kind of positive way. And I'll use this because I think the quantifiable piece is really important. For a long time, we used something called Q-scores. And now Q-scores are quotient scores that really measure the value to marketing and advertisers when they're looking at players. So when Derek Jeter retired from the Yankees, he was at a 26 Q-score at the time. And you can go up and down. People always ask me, I don't know where they are now. But what I can tell you is, for a number of years, we had two players, you know, in 2011 that were on the Q-score above a 20, and that was Shaq and Kobe. In 2018, we had 36, right? And it shows you the growth. And it's not just the names that you know, the LeBrons and the Stephs. It's younger players that are coming along and really creating that inspiration. And it's international players. And I always, you know, thank, you know, I had to really take a moment to thank Carol for the incredible work she did through UNICEF, engaging our players globally in things they care and passionate about and show them the right ways to go about doing the work. Um, you saw that popularity. And with that popularity, whether it be with Yao in China or Manu Ginobili in Argentina or doing our first game in Africa, you see the power of sport and the way you're able to do this in a long-term commitment. That sustainability creates business opportunity. You know, you look at our growth internationally and where we are uh, in the, you know, you look at Africa when we talked about that first story. We now have a Basketball Africa League where you have your teams committing across the continent. This is our third season. We just finished up. Um, and it's really helped grow and accelerate the business in, a, in an amazing way. Um, and that was due to the players and the commitment that they made very early on that we're going we're gonna to do this program. We're going to bring kids together, both boys and girls from around the continent, have them live together regardless of their background, their language, their religion, their race, whatever it is, and use the power of a ball 
to really bring them together because that love, that commonality is, 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 is a piece. And that's, you know, that comes back and translates into your business and it translates in a real positive way. And, you know, for MBA Cares, I always saw myself as a steward of it for the rest of the organization, that my goal was always to get the business units involved. So I always had a belief very early on that if they all believed it and really bought in, we can do amazing things together. And, and you know, thankfully at the MBA, we've had incredible leadership from David to Adam. I know uh, Carol mentioned that, but that has helped us really grow and really set us apart as a business, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and we're, we try to be as consistent as we can to that, but that is a collective effort. That is trying to create that opportunity for others to engage in the work, those stakeholders to bring them in and be a part of it, to feel that passion, to think about it not just as doing well, but doing good, right? And you can do that. And if you set those philosophies, it's behavioral change. It takes a long time. But wow, the power I've seen at the MBA and the work our colleagues have done has been simply incredible. And you know, again, all, all credit to our leadership here and our players that have really brought that to life. But I've seen that in a business way that translates in your growth and investment uh, and opportunity in terms of how you can grow globally and really do amazing things. That's amazing. And it's interesting because you touched on the word transaction. That That's not how you think about it. And it's instead, it's transformation. It's like how this how thinking through this lens. And it's also interesting because there are many different stakeholders. If you if purpose is the central DNA, you have fans and players and in your internal team culture and the folks who work there, geographic lines that are that are broken down. So it's uh, it raises it raises the tide for everyone across the board. It's been very hard, you know. You talk about that; people think it's very easy to do that. And we have a very long table of stakeholders that believe a lot of different things, and that's okay, right? You you know, I think one of the the key pieces during you, know, you talk about the transformation of this space, particularly over the last ten years. And one of the pieces I think that's been most important for us is empowerment of the trust in our stakeholders to share how they feel, but the responsibility to understand they're also part of a larger ecosystem that represents a bigger group and that you need to be cognizant of that when we're searching for things. We might not all agree on how we're going to get there, but we can agree on how we're going to address it. And we talk about purpose and everybody always talks about a lot of different ways and uses really buzzy words, but really it just start, it starts with your mission and values. Like who are you and how do you want to show up in the world? Because you know you can't control outcome, you can control process. And process starts with your values. And I think when you have really strong values where people understand where you're going to engage and how you're going to engage and how you're going to show up, you're starting ahead of, ahead of the curve. You know, unfortunately for our space, crisis breeds innovation. So you see a lot of people, they respond to things during times of crisis. That's when the investment happens. That's when the change happens. But, it, you know, it's not a great analogy, but I'll use it. But it's not like when a natural disaster hits. It's too late to do response work after the hurricane hits. You have to be prepared ahead of time. And that's the investment in the sustainability and belief in the space. If you believe in it, when tough times come, you're ready to respond. You're ready to take a moment that can be incredibly difficult where if you're not prepared, you're going to be chasing your tail a little bit. Instead, use it as an opportunity to really set who you are and how you're going to do this. It's not during good times. That's easy. It's during difficult times. Crisis, uh, right, doesn't build character. It reveals it. That's a great point. Great point. So for us, the stakeholders have been really important in that and giving them the space to be able to share their beliefs and their thoughts and their feelings is incredibly important. We have, you know, we have a lot of people that make this up and you forget um, there are people that are, you know, our players and our governors and their citizens and they have their own thoughts and beliefs and how they want to do it just like the staff does, just like others do. And so we try to create an environment for all our stakeholders where there's an on-ramp onto our work, where they understand what we're trying to accomplish, where they can be engaged in it in different ways. It's incredibly important. It's, it's again, it's, it's a collective of our work. And I think we try to create those moments for everyone. It kind of brings me to two different questions. But as you were talking, the two things I was thinking about, one is so new player, just had the draft, OK? New player, do you actually sit down and talk to them about purpose from day one? And what, is that, what does that look like? And then secondly, sponsors. How are sponsors responding to this? Two great questions. Um, first, let's talk about the players. You know, our department that I sit in in social responsibility, we talked about revising our strategy as a second piece. And I'll get to the third piece later on because I think it'll all kind of make sense. Part of our revising our strategy was to reset our department. So, you know, when you look at social responsibility groups in corporate, in sport, and others, 
it's not a one size fits all. It's a little bit more mechanic, not the car, meaning that if you look at different agencies, they will live in different places or businesses. So sometimes they live in communications groups, sometimes they live in the marketing group. I've seen some live under a CFO. I've seen some live under the C-level or the commissioner's office. It really has depended. For us, we created a group called Social Responsibility and Player Program. So really focusing on our players off the court. What are the spheres of influence around them and how do we set them up to be successful? That if they can do great things on the court and we can support them, all things will kind of go from there. And so we have, you know, the department is made up of not just social responsibility, but our youth basketball development. And then two other groups that has really helped drive our work with the players. One is our player marketing efforts. So you talk about partners and businesses. When players start, ultimately, if I were a player the same way, I'd want to know what my business opportunities are and what we can do. What our player marketing group has done is integrate them into our brand and said, look, you need to learn and be a really good brand ambassador first, and we can see how we can authentically work you in here um, because you are representing a larger kind of elite fraternity of people and men that came before you and men that will come after you and now on the women's side of the W the same way, and how do you create those moments? So understanding that they're now representing something much larger than themselves but have a lot of opportunity personally to, to do that. So our player marketing group really tries to work with them with the agents to do that. Then our player development group, and I think, Carol, this really gets to your question. You know, we have a program called the Rookie Transition Program. Um, so our players, after they're drafted, do go in. They have an opportunity to, um, you know, sit down for a few days with, you know, in conjunction with our Players Association to do a number of different programming and educational opportunities that is just a launching pad for them to continue throughout their career in the NBA and far beyond, right? It's entering the NBA. It's in the middle of your career and thinking about what do you want to do next? How do we integrate some of these amazing young men and women into our business in really thoughtful ways, not just through our sport, but through other business units that exist and how they want to show up. And I think if you, the more you're able to get those folks involved in your business, the stronger your business is going to be. Um, and so our group has really spent a lot of time doing those things. It's very, very thoughtful. You know, we work now with USA Basketball to do younger programs. We talk to parents and kids about decisions and how they want to show up. Because we've learned it's, it's making sure that at an early age, they're eating well, they're taking care of their bodies, they understand as a family what they want to talk about, what they want to focus on, what path they want to take. Sometimes college is the right path, sometimes it's something else. And that's okay. You know, I think you want to make sure but they have an opportunity to think and talk through it. So we're trying to create those moments that have those opportunities. I think for our business partners, what they've seen is they've seen the way we've approached this work. And what it's allowed us to do is build really thoughtful partnerships, investments. What I've learned about marketing partnerships for a long time, and I, I go back to a story in early 2000s that David was taking in front of our, um, our partnership group at the time. We were selling a partner. We're like, look, you can get this many logo placements here, and this is how many broadcast spots you get, and this is where we can put your logo on the court. And David's like, stop. It's not about just the what. It's the why. Right. And now we talk about that all the time, but you're talking 20 years ago. And I remember, you know, David sharing this and kind of saying, like, you got to show them on our values, like who we are and how we show up. When you share like minded values with a partner and how you want to show up, you're going to create more sustainable, long standing partnerships that are going to create more business opportunity because you need more runway to really grow and drive that impact. It's a harder relationship to sever because it's based not on activation, but on values and alignment. Um, and we've seen that with our partners. And I think one of the things you know, I'm most proud of is the work that we've been able to do with our partnerships group and how amazing that group has been about really sharing our story in a real authentic way and looking for partners that share our values in that way. And it's really helped drive business. So the approach is different, but we're always trying to be authentic. You know, I think the, the piece I would say as, as a little nugget here that we've learned is always be on a learning journey, always bring humility, always be willing to listen, always make sure you're not talking at your stakeholders, but with your stakeholders in these conversations. And that really makes a difference. It seems so small and, and simple, and yet in practice, you really got to remind yourself and keep grounded to do it all the time. Um, and I think that's something that we try to do with our programming and whether it be with players or partners or other stakeholders, we try to make sure we're listening and incorporating that into our work. So let me switch gears for a minute and, and talk about you. Okay, outside of the office, what role does purpose play? What else are you engaged and involved in? You know, I'm involved in a lot of different things. I think it, it's, it's manifested for me in a lot of different ways. I think going international, um, you know, spending time, Carol, with you and UNICEF and seeing the work that you're doing has inspired me while sport was my entryway into impact, it was, I think I got more excited about other ways you can bring impact in. So for me, the one of the 
pieces that I started to do in 2016 is teach. You know, I, I can't stress enough that I always have to be learning and I always want to be in a classroom around people that are passionate and interested and bring different nuggets of wisdom on the subject. And I got an opportunity to return to Columbia where I had got my master's to teach at SEPA, which has been a real honor and an opportunity for me to continue to grow in the work that I love to do. And so I teach a strategic social responsibility course and it's been, for me, it's been one of the most rewarding experiences to bring some of those exper things I'm learning in the classroom to the work I see every day. Sometimes taking a step out of your world and looking at things from a different point of view uh, helps you grow and be innovative in, in a way that uh, I didn't realize until I was doing it. And so being in the classroom has been one of my favorite things that I get to do. Don't tell my uh, students this, but I certainly get a lot more out of it, I think, than they do. But I really enjoy it. I also bring in, I brought in Carol and others into the class, and I love to hear from my contemporaries about what they're doing and be inspired by their work. And that's the piece that I think on the outside is always be learning and what you're doing. I also serve on a number of boards and I've had that opportunity. And it's different serving on a board. You know, you know, you, I'm so used to being the doer to have to sit back and not weigh in on every little detail, but look at the bigger picture of what they're trying to do and be supportive of the staff behind the scenes and, you know, taking that fiduciary responsibility that comes with being a board member. So, you know, serving on the UNICEF board has been amazing and, a, and an incredible learning experience and trying to bring impact to an organization I just have so much respect for and has been a big part of my life since I first started trick-or-treating for UNICEF when I was five uh, to working with the UJA and the Sports for Youth Committee and my colleagues around sports to really use sport as a tool to support the different great programming that is happening not only in the Tri-State area but in different areas around the world. So the work I've been able to do, um, I worked, I was on the board for Prevent Child Abuse America, it was very empowering for me. In college, I was a human development and family studies major. Um, I thought about going into family therapy, so to have to be able to, again, explore other interests I had. And the piece I tell people when they talk, I talk about this, this, this board work is everybody can do it. You know, it, again, it's time. I, I come back to time being an important piece because when people talk about this work, you get people sometimes with, with the language that's used and the phrases, and it's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can commit. A lot of it is like, what are you passionate about and how can you give your time to support it? it makes a huge difference. And that's the same philosophy I've taken to this work that I'm, I'm learning too. I'm trying to go and figure out my passions and how I want to grow and, and develop as an individual. And now I'm as a father and as a husband, what, do you, what does that come to life with? And so it's an important part of who I am. And you know that was instilled in me by my parents. I think my dad is somebody that particularly set that tone for me very early on. You know, if I could share a story, you know, he was a, a young teacher uh, at a school called Friends Academy. Um, he was in his 20s at the time, and one of his students had lost his father. Uh, and then uh, his mother was working two jobs and had a fire in her house. And, you know, the student was caught sleeping in the gym. My dad was now the athletic director at the time, and my dad wound up giving him keys to the gym and invited him over to eat meals and do certain things and didn't really tell, just did it. Years later, this guy went on to become a very successful businessman and went back and told this story about my dad that I never heard 40 years ago. So what always inspired me, and I, and I look at my dad, my mom was the same way, is it wasn't his job to do this, but it was kind of who, what made him tick and what kind of he wanted to do. And when, you're paying, when you pay it forward like that, I know it seems cliche, but it does make a huge difference, right? Those moments, again, you know, they're there, and you can be tra anybody can be transformative in a moment um, if you take the time and attention to listen and pay attention and, and be there in a real kind of, be there in a real way. And so I try to do that when I can. Obviously, like everybody else, sometimes you get caught up in the day to day, but I try to ground myself with that as much as possible. And you know, the other piece I would share as a nugget of wisdom is talk talk to your contemporaries. I call Carol all the time about advice and just sharing ideas and. You know, it just brings you back and grounds you in terms of why am I doing this and what do I, what, how do I want to show up in the world and what do I want to do to make a difference? And, it, and it's important that it comes down to being authentic. You have to be authentic in this. You can't fake this work. And I get asked this by a lot of companies and pieces. It's, it's not rocket science, but it does take, it's hard to look in the mirror during tough times and be committed to your values. And we've seen that with businesses. And if you're not consistent during those times, it will impact your business long term. Right, And so it's really important to do that personally, and it's important to do that professionally. So we always wrap up by asking our guests to give a gift to our listeners. So what do you got for our swag bag? So I put something on my – I have a worksheet for my team. Um, I think they would make fun of me if they heard this right now, but I'm going to share it anyway. I have a saying on the bottom of my worksheet, and I've had it for a number of years. Details, 
process creativity. And when somebody starts, they usually ask me what it means, but those are the secrets to impact for me. That you know, everybody always has a great idea, but if you can't do the little things really well and pay attention to the details, you can't handle the big things. And unless you have a strong process, you're not gonna achieve the outcome you want or be able to go back, because the last piece of wisdom is define success and measure it. Understand the changes you need to make to drive success. So having a strong process and being a good communicator, then you can take an idea and be, make it real. So I know everybody loves to come up with the big idea. I remind my team, learn how to take an idea from start to fruition, and you'll be able to achieve anything you want. So it starts with the details and doing the little things, driving a strong process. Then when you have that great idea, you can really drive impact. Amazing. And it's interesting also that, you know, the notion of purpose not being what you do but who you are because that translates into small interactions in the hallway to, you know, to, and to the, to the big stuff and working with sponsors and, and everything in between. We're all different, and it doesn't matter what you do. By the way, I tell this to the lawyers and the finance people. We're all committed to the same piece. We all, you know, those values of who we want to be and how we want to show up are so important. Um, and being clear about those as an organization gives everybody a place of how we want to start and how we want to address challenges and good opportunities. And that creates opportunities for innovation. It creates opportunities to manage and use crisis as an opportunity as an advantage. And it creates that competitive advantage. And it creates a stronger business longer term. And those are things that you know we truly believe in and we try to live every day. At scale also, because it's not just an individual person involved or individual player. It raises, it just raises consciousness across every touch point. Oh. Amazing. Great. Todd, thank Amazing. you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor to be here today. Thank you, Todd. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen on Purpose is a series as part of Kindred Cast from Kindred Media and Audiation with the phenomenal music by Rachel's 10-year-old son, Noam Kraus. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe to Kindred Cast wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review letting us know what you think. We are your hosts, Rachel Kraus and Carol Stern. Thank you for listening. And find your purpose. <laughs>